Uh, for those of you who are joining new, as Julia said, this is based on a book that I'm working with uh, colleagues, uh, Serge Ray and Levi Wolf. Um, it's fully available online. It's free and will always be free online. But if you want to support uh, the development, when the book comes out, you're all more than welcome to buy one or 10 copies of it and uh, make us uh, a bit happier. So the previous session, in the previous session, Pedro focused on um, regression, and that was chapter 11. On this session, we're going to focus on chapter, on, on chapter 12, which we call as spatial feature engineering. It's a very fancy term. It's actually something very relatable, hopefully. So um, let me start actually. Oh, and then, sorry, the final bit of, uh, I knew I, there was something else. For those of you who are joining new, if you have a, a computer in front of you, which you probably have if you're joining remotely, and an online connectivity, which you also should have if you're joining remotely, you can follow along interactively running code on your own uh, on your own end, thanks to Binder. So you can come to the chapter page as I'm doing, uh, hover over the rocket icon, and then on Binder, and I'm going to do Control so it opens in a new um, tab. And this should build a new uh, an online cloud instance uh, to run the book interactively. Uh, very quickly, uh, it's Binder is great for many reasons, but it has two catches. The first one is uh, it's a, what we call an ephemeral um, instance. So as soon as you close the tab, everything is gone. So if you want to save something that you edit, you should download it before closing the tab. And then the second catch is that also because it's an ephemeral instance, if you don't touch it in a few minutes, say I think it's five or 10 minutes, the instant will time out and it will be discontinued. So you will have to close the tab and re-spin um, re it up. Okay, uh, there's a call, uh, question, Judy Coleman. Uh, I missed the previous session. Will the recording be available? I believe so. Uh, Julia is on the, on the mission for that, but yes, it will be available. And I imagine the Center for Spatial Data Science uh, useful channels, Twitter and so on, will will make it available on the website. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to uh, switch to the notebook. So one of the things that is a little different from standard books on on our book is that well, it's online, it's free, which is also not very useful. But all the content that you see rendered on the website, it's actually rendered from another file format called Jupyter Notebooks, which are files that allow you to weave narrative with code and with the output of code. So all you see here on the on the website is a, is a sort of nicely dressed up version of, of the books, of the notebooks. The notebook files you can download from GitHub if you want, and that's what you get on, on Binder when you spin up the, the instance. So before uh, I start the actual feature engineering, let me go back to the previous chapter that um, that Pedro spent some quality time with. So underneath much of what Pedro talked about in the previous session was how you could embed space in your, in your models. And most of what, or almost everything he talked about was how you could embed it in linear models. Now, if you're familiar with, with modeling, modeling is a, goes a long way beyond um, linear models. There's a lot of nonlinear models and there's a lot of models that are, uh, well, they're different nonlinear parametric models and there's a lot of also nonlinear non-parametric models. And a lot of what today we call uh, machine learning or, or data science less machine learning is actually non-parametric, nonlinear. So what we, one of, I think one of the, I was thinking about this while I was listening to Pedro, one of the great things of the two of us doing this is that even though we're both economists by training, Pedro has really these econometrics perspectives. He's very much building from a traditional linear model and then embedding space into it. And as you will see, I'm, I've am i kind of like a Pokemon evolved into something else that is not fully econometrics, uh, but very much inspired by it. So the way I explain what spatial feature engineering is or how it fits with the book and how it fits with the previous session goes like this. What Pedro's been saying is, okay, we start with a, 
traditional model that looks like this is a linear model that has a dependent variable that we're calling here price, but it could be y, it could be anything. And then we have some variables that relate to, to that variable. So in, in our case, the price related to, to properties, to Airbnb properties, whether they're houses or apartments or, or, or boat, river boats. Um, and then we have, we wanna explain their price as a function of a series of characteristics. This is a very traditional setup in econometrics. Those characteristics we traditionally call X as a, as a, as a, ser as a uh, our list of explanatory variables or exogenous variables, econometric, econometricians would say, or if you come more from the data science world, this is also called features. The X there is what the ML world would call the features. And before you do anything with it, if you just look at this, uh, at this, at this uh, equation, there is absolutely no space there, right? All the features that we have, all the explanatory variables are attributes or properties of its house. It was the number of uh, rooms, the, the number of people that it accommodates, whether it has a pool or not, as many as you want. We had some and you could you know, think of many more. But in spatial analysis or geographic data science, we say that that's a non-spatial model. And the best way I have to explain why that's non-spatial is you could take any of these Airbnb houses, airlifted from where they are actually located, move them somewhere else. And as far as the model is concerned, nothing has changed, right? And there's no reason, the, the reasoning follows, why the price should have changed. Now, in reality, that, that might be a hard sell. You can have a, the same house that it's in the middle of nowhere, you airlifted right to downtown of a place, and without changing anything else in the house, you might expect its price to, to change, right? And the point of a lot of what Pedro and I and you know, the Center for Spatial Data Science and, and others do is think about ways as conceptual or as specific as you want on how that realization that if you airlift a house in the case of a house, but in almost any other problem, you can find an equivalent. If you airlift this house from the middle of nowhere to the city center, the model should be aware of that change. And what really changes in a lot of, in the different flavors of spatial analysis or, or embedding space in data sciences is how we make our, our model aware. So what Pedro spent most of the session talking about is ways in which we can make the model itself. So the specification of the model aware of that spatial location. And that can be either as in, in as in, the location, so either being in, in place A or place B. But towards the end, he, was, he also started talking about spatial dependence, which is about not really where you are, but where you are in relation to everyone else. What is the topology, the spatial configuration? All of that are ways of embedding space throughout the modeling route, right? And if you think about it, Pedro pulled off this idea of embedding space with attaching the features. So we still had the same variables. We didn't change any of that. What we're gonna do now in spatial feature engineering is embed space through the other door, right? Rather than through, through the model, we're not gonna change this equation. This equation is gonna remain the same and the model hence is gonna remain the same. In fact, we're not gonna do much modeling per se in, in this chapter, but we're gonna think of ways in which we can leverage space to make our models better through making our features, to, through making our, our variables better. And econometricians then, it's not they don't like, but they don't see a lot of value in them because from the point of view of the model, nothing changes. You can still run a linear model. And in fact, you can go even further and say, you don't even have to run a linear model. It doesn't have to be an econometrics model. You could run a random forage, you can run a gradient boosted tree, you can run any, model, whether parametric or not, um, and change the features. So in a way, this is a bit more boring from the econometrics point of view, because we're sticking to the to the bare bones when it comes to the modeling state. But I think in, in some ways, it's a lot more interesting because it's a lot more portable. It's a way of embedding space that's a lot more portable to other approaches. OK? Um, Yes, I think that I lost my train of thought. But 
Okay, so that's a bit of conceptual framing. Now let's switch to the chapter on, on feature engineering. So feature engineering, the chapter is called fe spatial feature engineering, and it's a play or an extension on the term feature engineering, which is, it's a thing if you've, if you've learned any, uh, if you've read any, if you've picked up a machine learning book or a data science, if you've taken data science 101, it's a, it's a pretty standard term that you would come across. And again, it's a fancy way of saying variable selection or variable, gen, not selection, variable creation. It's, and the idea when you come from machine learning is a lot of the data that we have come in a, a non-structured form. We may have uh, sound snippets, we may have text snippets, we may have images that contain a lot of information, but they don't contain it in a structured way. So the process in that context, the process of feature engineering is turning a, a, a text corpus or a sound snippet or an image into a table effectively with rows for every observation and columns for every feature, for every variable that we can then plug into a model that we can use to estimate whatever we want. And that model could be to predict something that we don't know or to, to build a model that we can then plug with data that allows us to predict things that we don't know yet, like predicting online behavior. If you have a lot of information on uh, the behavior of users on a website, or it could be also in the more traditional social sciences, a model that allows us to understand better a, um, a phenomenon. And the reason why feature engineering is not that common in social sciences is because 99% of the times you don't need it. Your features are derived already. So when you go to the census website and download a table, that's a table of features. You, you don't have to engineer anything. So most people who work with tabular data, they don't necessarily think of, of feature engineering as, a, as an important step other than the so-called cleaning, which is a data cleaning, which is a term I hate for, for many reasons. But that's feature engineering, but it's a very minimal one because it's a transformation for removing observations that you don't care about or that you, that are, you identify as erroneous, et cetera. But when you come from the data science world, where it's, it's a, I'm, I might sound biased here, is a bit more open-minded in the sense that data is a lot more things than just simple tables. The step to go from the data that you get from the real world into the data that you can plug into your model, whether it's an econometric regression or a machine learning algorithm, it's a much less, you know, it's a non-trivial one. So it's it's paid a lot of um, a lot of attention and effort. So feature engineering is huge in in sound analysis and imagery, and you could argue actually that most of the the power of neural nets is automating this idea of of um, feature engineering for particular types of data. So you feed the image entirely and you don't have to engineer any feature. The network does it as part of the prediction, the prediction step. Um, in space, we've actually been doing feature engineering, I think, for a long time. And we don't realize that that's what it is. And I think it's it's part on us to not being able to market it in, in this way, because I think there's a lot of uh, value in paying attention to, to spatial feature engineering. So what do we mean by spatial feature engineering is feature engineering where we leverage the power and the value of the of spatial location, where we're doing that transformation of raw into processed data through uh, the role of space or through the use of location. And there's diff different ways that we can do it. And, and then the last general thing I will say is that this may be econometrically boring, but it's actually one of the biggest, I think, developments in, in data science that has happened in the last few years. If you've heard of the term data-centric AI or data-centric um, data science, which sounds like a bit of a sort of saying the same thing twice, actually not. Uh, I, I don't know exactly who, who invented it. I think the person who's popularized, popularized the most is Andrew Nge out of, out of Stanford and a whole bunch of other outlets who's been argued for a few years now that we've probably paid too much attention to finicky details in the models and too little to get either better data or more or different transformations, different types of feature engineering. And, and his point is, if you really want either performance or better models to understand processes, you probably ha have, you're probably gonna get more bang for your buck by either thinking about how to get more data or how to get more out of your data rather than finicky details on your on your models. So yeah, this is fairly controversial for a lot of people for obvious reasons, but it's out there. And I think it's a thing that's becoming at least important to keep in mind. So I think against that backdrop, the chapter of 
space of feature engineering is statistically boring, you could think of, of it, but I think it's, it's also very valuable because to me is the way in which the geospatial, the geo community has to contribute to that discussion. And I think there's a lot of value to, to extract. So, all right, enough of, um, of general framing and, and context that I can go on and on. How do we approach feature engineering in, in the chapter? Uh, we here. Where do we? Okay, I'm gonna go to the um, index. So the chapter is structured in two two main parts, uh, in which we or two broad groups of that we we think are useful to think about feature engineering on or spatial feature engineering. One is what we call map matching, and this is not our term. This is something that, it, particularly if you're working in industry, is much more common than in, in academia. And the other one is what we term, and there's probably other names for it, and, and you know, what we thought it was useful for the chapter, what we call map synthesis. So the idea of map matching, I'm going to jump on, on map matching first, and then we'll go on map uh, synthesis, and I'll, I'll talk about it. Let me start running things just in. Um, so what's the idea of uh, map matching? Map matching is basically leveraging the power of, of space that, that says that, or to me, is, is this idea that space is the ultimate linkage key across different data sets. So if you're familiar with the, the databases world, or if you've worked with a lot of um, data from different sources, which if you've worked with data, you 99% uh, you have a 99% chance of actually having worked with different data sets because you almost never get all the data you want from one place. You're familiar with this idea of, of joining the different data sources, joining tables, combining data from different sources. If you're lucky that the two data sets have been related by to each other by either usually some other agency, like in the case of the census, then this is straightforward. You usually have two tables and both tables have a column that is in common. It might be user IDs, it might be firm IDs, it might be even census geography uh, unique codes. If that's the case, there's no space to leverage because you don't need it. You can just make that direct connection. Now, however, in most cases that actually doesn't, doesn't always happen. And what you have is, in at least in geographic data science, you have cases where you have data that come from disparate sources that don't have a unique link key because there's not an obvious one. But what you do know is that both data sets have a spatial dimension, which is to say they, they have a locate, every observation in the two data sets are, can be pinpointed to a, a place over the geography. And the point what Matt Matchin tries to do is leverage that location. So space is sort of this unifying key that allows you to connect observations between different data sets because you know they are located in the same place. Now, this sounds, well, it sounds because it is conceptually a relatively straightforward idea. Of course, the devil's always in the details, right? So if you have points that are that refer to the same entity, so if you have two data sets that refer to, to addresses, for example, we were just talking in the break about geocoding. If you have data that refer to addresses, but you don't have the, the addresses are expressed in different ways, you can geocode and it's the same place. But what if you have data from uh, zip codes and then data from census tracts, from census geographies, which of course they relate to, to the same places, but not exactly to the same ones, right? They, they, they don't perfectly overlap. That's the whole point of zip codes versus geographies. Or what if you have point data sets, a point data set and a polygon data set? Or what if you have two point data sets that actually don't overlap, that are nearby each other, but they're not, um, are not the same. You still can gain quite a bit of intelligence by combining the information on the two, but you have to think of clever tricks to, to bring them together, right? So this is effectively what map matching is, is all about. It's about using space as the ultimate linkage key to combine sources of data that come from different places in non-obvious or non-trivial ways. When it's, non, when it's not straightforward, when it's straightforward, it's just called table linkage or data linkage or database linkage. And it's basically an SQL join, right? But one is non-trivial, but you can use space to, to kind of connect. The, the way I think of it is you th if you think of every data set as a layer over space, 
you're taking the information that's embedded in one data set and somehow magically transferring it over to the other one or to a third one that is that you use to bring the two. And it's pretty powerful, right? Because otherwise you wouldn't be able to stick the two in your model. You would either have to pick one or pick the other um, for your model. So my matching is, is sort of this um, unsung hero, I think, of, of data science with spatial data because it makes possible a lot of things, but not a lot of people pay attention to. So in the chapter, we cover several types of, of map matching or several use cases. And, and I should say, and this goes on for the book, the book is, is an overview of a lot of things. Every chapter could be its own book. And, and in fact, in many cases, there are books about the topics of a, a single chapter. What we do in, in the book and particularly in this chapter is trying to give you an overview of conceptually what is what you're trying to do here and then point you in the direction of more sophisticated references that might, might give you more, more detail. So we cover, um, I'm going to expand it here a bit. This is map matching. We cover a few, um, a few use cases. The first one is counting nearby features. This is something you, you, might, you may have done if you've taken a GIS course. This is some people might despectively classify it as just traditional GIS. We think it's actually extremely useful and, and you know, just because it's not easy, but just because it solves problem doesn't mean it's not powerful for, for a lot of models. So the idea here is that you have two data sets and, the, and in the book, we have an example with um, the Airbnb data set that Pedro was talking in the previous session, where we wanna, you're thinking, well, one of the reasons why an Airbnb might be more expensive is because it allows you access to more amenities. So certainly me, when I am looking for an Airbnb, one of the things I check is, how many coffee shops can I get to? How many restaurants can I go walk in, in within walking distance from the Airbnb, right? And I would imagine that whoever is putting out an, an Airbnb out there will know these and will try to charge a, a premium for, for having more access. Definitely the descriptions would suggest that, right? They'll say access, walking access to all the amenities of so-and-so neighborhood. So one way in which you could embed this, this, this idea into a model would be, Augmenting the base model that Pedro talked about, where you explain the, the price as a function of a bunch of characteristics of the house, including also the number of amenities that are surrounding the, the house. And to do that, you have to, you need two things. You need the data set of, of Airbnb locations, you need a data set of amenities, and then crucially, you need a way of connecting the two. You need a way, what I think of those two layers, you have the, the Airbnb, um, the Airbnb locations here, you have the amenities here, you need a magic way to transfer the information in this layer all the way to this one. And the way we do it here is one of the simplest one, which is drawing, you know, throwing a, a circle, a buffer around every point, and then counting how many amenities in the layer there are. And then that way, what you end up at the end of the day in crude terms is with an extra column that it's a count of how many bars are within X distance. So I'm not going to go through the code for that, but that's one. The second one is um, it's sampling values from a surface into a, a point data set. So if we stick to the um, example of, um, of Airbnb locations, every, every location is a point. We have the x, y coordinates. And then you might also hypothesize that being higher, San Diego actually, if you've been to the city, is a city with a lot of canyons, is a city with a bit of elevation, and depending on how far back in, into the desert you go, there's, there's actually a few uh, hills, I'm going to call them hills, I'm too much of a European to call those mountains, but there's a bit of elevation, right? So you could hypothesize that if you're very high, you might not be able to, to charge as much because A, you have to lug your luggage, your, your backpack all the way up the hill, but also every time you want to leave it, if you want to access all the amenities, you might have to go down, which means inevitably you will have to go back afterwards. In other words, the, the sort of underlying idea in this hypothesizing is that how high the, eleva what the elevation of the house might be relevant. And elevation is something that usually is measured in, in surfaces. There are uh, what's called DEMs, digital elevation models. And this is, again, it's, it's a piece of 
you know, 50 years ago was a piece of science fiction and now it's boring because it's a solved problem, but it's still incredible that we have a data set that will give you a 30 meter by 30 meter resolution, the elevation anywhere on, on the earth. And this data exists. NASA has, has a product called ST, ST, STRM, I think, or STFRM. Um, but other agencies, other space agencies have similar products and, um, and you can choose different ones. We're choosing elevation because it's a classic one, and I think it, it's intuitive for the regression, but this idea of having uh, continuous data sets or, or surfaces, like Pedro was saying, the, the notion is continuous, but the, the data is not. It's just a regular grid. In other words, in, it's, a, it's a raster data set. It's very, very common. If you're, depending on what you're working, you might want to think of temperature, and temperature is usually distributed as a surface. You might think of chance of rain, and that you might want to assign to a location for routing issue for routing problems, etc. And and actually, increasingly, more and more data are distributed as, as surfaces that traditionally were not necessarily covered as surfaces. So population is is one that in the last five ten years, population had traditionally been distributed always on on polygons, on census geographies or or similar. And now projects like the World Pop or like the GHSL are distributing planetary grids. For, for population. So in some cases, it's it's a really handy thing to be able to say, I have this point, I wanna know in this massive file, because you can imagine these files are very large. I wanna know what's the value of this point in this, in this surface. And you don't necessarily wanna load the whole file. You might not even be able. So what we're doing that section is show you how in Python you can do it relatively straightforwardly in a way that doesn't require uh, to load the whole thing, you sample uh, the location, you get the value, but you don't you don't have to load the, the function, and it's 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 pretty powerful. So that's another way. So we've seen one, which is um, counting points around another point data set. This is sampling from from surfaces. So you you maybe start seeing the pattern of the map matching section, which is how do you transfer the information encoded in one geography into another one in ways that then allows you to plug in the, that, that data into your model. Another one that we really only scratch the surface of, but it's, it's, it's actually one where there's a lot more modeling just to transfer the information than, than you might think, is how, you, how do you transfer information from a point data set to another point data set in a way uh, that is, well, that, it, that does exactly that, transferring information rather than counts, right? So the first example I gave, it, it was about knowing how many occurrences in the other data set exist. That's just counting. But if those occurrences had a, a value, an attribute, how do you transfer that attribute? How do you know, for example, that um, the average in an example might be if you want, um, this is also used a lot for something called space interpolation or, or Kriegin. If you have just one data set, that has house prices, you know the, the price in certain locations, you then want to know the price in another location based entirely on space. Or you have, the weather is another great example, you have the uh, weather measurement, temperature measurement, rain measurement in the meteorological stations that are located in, on in so many places because there's only so much money to buy sensors. But you want the, that information not in that location, but in your location of interest, maybe in one of the Airbnb houses. So how do you get the temperature for a location for which you don't have uh, a measurement? And there's a lot of, this is one of those that you, you could, and in fact, there, there exists a lot of books that, that cover many techniques. A lot of them come from a pretty longstanding tradition in geostatistics and Kriegin. And more recently, there's, there's alternatives too that are based in machine learning, things like Gaussian mixture models or um, some neural networks kind of replicate these, these processes and, and do okay. Um, they, they're not necessarily better for every problem, but there's also an, a newer literature that looks at that. So what we do in the chapter is we use the simplest possible algorithm that you, we could think of to, to illustrate the concept and then point you in the direction of a few more, a bit more sophisticated um, references and the the um, algorithm we use in particular is point inter, uh, distance weighted interpolation where you're basically you can think if you have three meteorological stations or three thermometers over space 
and you have a, po a point in the middle for which you want the temperature, you would basically get a weighted average or an average of those three that is weighted by the distance to which the point is. That's a very simple one, but in many cases is, is good enough to, to get you where you want to be. And crucially, it allows you to take a measurement of a variable for which you don't have values in your data set of interest, bring it from this other data set, right? And then once you have that estimate, you can plug it in your models or do whatever you want with it. Okay. The next one we cover, I'm just gonna browse through that very quickly is polygon to point. It's another one that if you've done GIS, people would say is a boring GIS 101 thing. Again, to me, boring means robust, well-tested and very useful. So that's a good thing. This is uh, bringing information that you have on, on polygon geographies into points. So you can think again, you might want to attach to your house locations, the characteristics of the neighborhood that the census provides. So the census will provide them at the block or the block group or the track level. And conceptually, this one is very simple. It just requires you to know in which polygon the, um, the point is, and then you can sort of open the floodgates to transfer the information from one to the other. In GIS parlance, this is a spatial join. So it's like a table join, but it's, it's based on space. So we're using a, a spatial predicate or a spatial relationship. In this case, they contains. So we're saying if the point is contained by the polygon, they are connected and you can attach the information from the polygon to the point. That's fine, but I'm not gonna spend more time on that, but it's, it's another one we cover because it's a useful one. And then the final one that I, I did want to, um, I did want to cover uh, is because in some ways is one of the, the ones where in PySAL, I think we have a bit of a comparative advantage. So in, in some of the other examples, we're making use of the, the standard and state-of-the-art tools in the Python ecosystem. For a lot of the GIS type of operations, we use GeoPandas, which builds on pandas. For the interpolation, we actually use scikit-learn, which is the standard default uh, library. And it's a nice way of seeing how you can integrate spatial, um, spatial constructs that you get from PySAL, like spatial weights, into very standard machinery for data science, like scikit-learn. And then for this one, we actually use one of our, our own libraries. So I think it's a, good, a better showcase of, of the kind of stuff that PySAL, PySAL does. Before I get into this one, is there any, are there any questions so far or uh, either from the room or from the virtual room? Anyone on the, on the chat have any questions? Cool, excellent, all crystal clear. Probably has nothing to do with the fact it's 4 p.m. Chicago time by now. So this, the final example or illustration of map matching that I'm gonna cover, and I'll actually show a little bit of, of code, is this idea of area-to-area -area interpolation or area-to-area -area polygon to polygon transfer. This is also a huge industry on its own. You might have seen it as dissymmetric mapping in some cases or spatial, uh, area interpolation or um, polygon interpolations. The idea conceptually, again, is very simple. You have information uh, at a geography that is expressed in polygons. You can think of census tracts and you, and you wanna bring that information or that data, the data contained in that geography, you wanna bring it to your data set of interest, which is expressed also in polygons, but with a very different geography, right? So if you, a very classic example for social scientists in the US might be you have, you wanna run a, a regression at the track level, at the census track level, but some of the crucial information you wanna include in your model is provided at the zip code. Zip codes, well, first don't really exist as a thing. They're not really a polygon. They're sort of a delineation of, of places, um, but you can create somehow of a polygon out of a zip code. And that polygon has nothing to do with the with census geographies. They overlap, they cut across, and they contain, in some cases, many of those smaller geographies. So even though conceptually it's 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 trivial to think of what you want to do, it's how, it's actually pretty tricky to think of a clever way to transfer that information. So what we do in the chapter is show the simplest possible case for these, again, as a way of illustrating the point, and then 
somehow point. Although in this one, I think there's a lot of literature, but there's not as much tooling. And I think there's, it's also poised to, I would hope grow, but at least there's, I think there's a lot of, you know, th there's much more than finicky minor details to be improved by bringing things like machine learning because it's effectively a prediction problem. Regression and a lot of the stuff that we do in social sciences is not effectively a prediction problem. This is. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of room for, for improving in, in that direction. But what we do in, in our case is the simplest algorithm that, that we know of this that is called an area weighted interpolation. So what we're doing here is you combine the two, if you think of the two data sets that you have, you combine them into what I always call a massive cookie cutter that creates the, the smallest possible units that you would get, the smallest possible polygons that you would get by combining the boundaries of the two data sets. And you keep the ideas of where that small unit would, where that small unit belongs in data set A and data set B, or data set source and data set target. And then you also keep the area of that, uh, of that small polygon. So what you do is you get the target geography and look at how do you make up that geography as a function or as a combination of those small slivers and then add up, get a, an average of the values in the source geography, but then weighted by the area of those small polygons, okay? Conceptually is relatively straightforward. And I think intuitively is pretty sound. It has a big catch, right? Maybe some of you might be seeing it already that, but this is a catch not really of the method, it's a catch really of how your data comes from, right? If you don't have more information. And the catch is that the assumption here, the big elephant in the room, is that the data that you have at the polygon level is uniformly distributed within the, within the polygon. Or in other words, in more pragmatic terms, is that whether it's uniformly distributed or not, you don't know it. So you probably your best bet is assuming that it is uniformly distributed. And it really depends on the problem you're working on, whether that's actually a, a sound assumption to, to, to latch your analysis to or, or not. And it's also a case-by-case -case, uh, situation, whether you can actually do something else altogether about it or not. Because if, if all you have is those two, two data sets, you probably are, you know, this is the best you can do. There are many ways in which you can, however, improve that, that prediction. And the, the problem here is, for example, for census geographies is, is an, an easy illustration. Census geographies are not always uniform within, within themselves. You have counties, for counties are probably the, the best example. You have counties that contain super urbanized chunks, which tend to be in one corner, and then super non-urbanized or effectively empty um, in other parts. And what you, all you see when you get the data is that the polygon that you get has one value. So you, if you assume that that's uniformly distributed, say for example, population, you know that's the best you can do if all you have is the data, but the reality is that most of that value will be assigned to a small part in the corner of the polygon, everything else will be empty. So if you had any way of figuring out that that's the case, you, want, you then want to incorporate it in, in how you do this transfer from one polygon layer to the other, okay? So that's how, and a lot of what you would see in the literature's asymmetric mapping is effectively trying to come up with clever ways in which you can incorporate ancillary information from other sources, things like land use. So for example, if you had a land use layer, you could see that most of the polygon is water, for example. So you can make the Non, not so heroic assumption that people don't live on water and then discard that as the area that you use for the weighting and that would improve your, your, your transfer, right? So that, that's the direction in which a lot of the disymmetric um, mapping goes towards. A lot of, some of that disymmetric mapping can be um, systematic, not systematic was the word, um, deterministic in that you, you just say, if you have land uses, you can say, well, I know that these three uses don't house people, so I'm just gonna use a mask that where there is, where you find these uses, I just assume it doesn't exist. A lot of the, the more, I think modern and 
conceptually from a as an academic much more interesting type of basimetric mapping is trying to build a predictive model that learns some features in your source geography to predict your the the variable the outcome that you want to transfer and then once you fit that model you deploy it in your in your target destination to create those predicted estimates and that's actually a lot more on a case by case basis but that's i think where where that literature is is going and and if that's where it's going you could see how machine learning can be super helpful because effectively you don't really care how it's each feature helps you predict the, the estimate. What you really care is that it predicts it well, right? And that you have good ways of predicting it. So I think there's a lot of a lot of room in that in that world. But long way of saying that you will not find that in the book. We you will find pointers. What you will find in the book is an illustration on how to do the simpler one, which in most cases is is good enough and in and it's a lot better than not doing anything. And in many cases, I think it's it gets you a good way into the benefit. The, in, in other words, the marginal improvement that you get from not doing anything and not using the data into doing these versus doing these and using a more fancy approach, um, I think is better to is, is better bang for your buck. So that's the part that I've just uh, explained. We use a library here, here called um, Tobler, which is a homage to the to the uh, Geographer Walter Tobler, it was released, I think, within a month of when he passed away. And it's all about these kinds of algorithms. There's there's different methods for transferring data from polygon layers to other polygon layers. And within Tobler, we use a module called area weighted, which is all the methods that we have for um, this area weighting approach. And in particular, we use the area interpolate, which does what I, which does the cookie cutter exercise that I explained a minute ago. So, in the example uh, or in the chapter, we use an example where we have information from the census that comes at the track level. So we have a census track geography, and I think we have population density and and um, ethnic background counts, and then we, in, in our illustration, we want to transfer that to a, a regular grid, one of the ones that, that Pedro was talking about before, the H3 hexagon. So you have a, a layer of hexagon geographies. So a bunch of regular, it's a regular grid of, of hexagonal geometries. And you could think of, if you have many data sets, one approach in some cases that might, that might work is rather, if you don't have any particularly sensible default geography, you might, it might be useful to bring all of your other data into this one common geography. And in, in our case, it could be hexagons or it could be whatever you want. So we have a data set uh, that we pre-created. You can also check it. I didn't say, but in the book, we have an appendix online that goes online only with how we created all the data sets. So if you want to see the code that we use for creating it is there. But for now, you we, we have the file ready to go. So we just read it here with... Uh, Japan that read, read file is a geo package and then it, it comes um, online. So, whoops. Just because I can, I'm going to show you the explore cool feature, which, if you haven't checked out um, Geopandas in a while, gives you an interactive map. Uh, so, this is the layer that we are um, aiming to get our information on. And our data comes from, where is it? Yeah, SD pop. It might take a little while. Actually, just so my computer doesn't crash, I'm gonna show you the other just as cool feature, which is a static plot. So this is the geometries, the geography at which we have our data. We have census, this is census tracts for the metro area of San Diego. The uh, information that we have coming from the census so is attached to every polygon, uh, every little polygon or, or not so little in this layer contains a few values. And what we wanna do is create estimates 
of what would be the value for these variables, for these features in this geography, in the um, hexagons, okay? And if you've understood the idea that I explained a couple of minutes ago of how air interpolation works, that's basically all you need to do it because it's, oh, well, it's a one call. In our case, is many lines of code because we have uh, a lot of documentation, but it's a single call to this function called area interpolate where we pass the source geographies. In our case, the source is the San Diego population data set. We make sure that it's expressed in the same projection. So they actually overlap over space. So we can use space as a linkage key. Then the target data frame is the H3 set of hexagons. And then here is another uh, cool feature of the, of the library. There, there are different ways of creating these estimates depending on the type of data that you have. And we distinguish here between uh, extensive and intensive variables. So extensive variables are uh, things like counts. So uh, population, uh, number of facilities, number of firms, whatever you want, counts. Area could be in other words, a count of meters, square meters. Intensive variables are, are frequencies, are ratios, things like density, things like income per capita, things like, um, you name it. Um, it's too late in the day for me to think of more examples. And you have to, spec you, can, you can interpolate both, but you have to specify what, what kind of animal it is. Because the way you do this transfer, you can imagine that an average of, of averages is not necessarily the best way, um, so you can't treat it. Well, an average of counts is is a is a, a sound thing to do. So that's how you specify it. We run it, and of course, it doesn't run because I did not import it. Then you do, and this takes a little bit because a my machine is not super powerful, and b. Um, remember that what it's doing is creating the, the smallest possible polygons that will not be crossed by any border, either in the source or in the target, and then apportioning those from the source to the destination to the target based on uh, area weights. Okay. Once you have it, what you get back is uh, it's another data frame, and you I can just print it here, interpolate it, and it's a data frame that has a set of geometries, which is the target geometry. So in our case, this is a bunch of hexagons. And then it has the two, the in our case two, but all the variables that you've interpolated from the source geography. And the values are not, of course, the values in the source. They are the values that have been estimated for the target geometry, okay? So you start with the two data frames. The column is only, the columns that you care about are only in one data frame and you would really want to have them on the other data frame and that's what you get as the output for, for this one. So I'm gonna skip the code for visualization here, but this is an, uh, a summary of what we're doing in, in, the, in, the, in this exercise. We have the, I think this is a population two density or, no, I'll do the density one. It's probably a bit more, yeah. You have your population density map that comes at the census geography because the population counts come from the census. And they have your target geometries, which are hexagons, because that's the cool thing to do. So you want your density at the hexagons. And then once you run Tobler, what you get is these. And of course, you can see there's a few things that you can learn, learn from these. One is that hopefully, if things go okay, the pattern between this polygon here and sorry, this layer and this layer, the pattern should be similar because otherwise something's gone wrong. And it might have not gone wrong. It might have just been that these area interp these geographies are, are so different that it, it doesn't resemble one another, but this is the best you can do. Um, but also the thing to, to keep in mind, and this is not really about area interpolation. This is all really I, I wanted to say about the algorithm, but the more general point about transferring to geometries, which is, I think, something we were talking the other day over beers, and I think it's probably not, not, not said often enough, is that my experience when you present this set of techniques to people who work a lot with data is that uh, 
they're really excited because I think it actually is super powerful. It allows you to bring data that exist in many different sources to your own home where you can do this modeling. And there is the risk of almost overconfidence in what the actual model does, because it is a little bit of magic, right? You have these two tables, two geographies, and then at the end of the day, the column that you had in one data, you have it in the other one, and there are, and there are values, and that's what you want, that's amazing. And sometimes your target geography has been selected because it's more fine-grained or because it's more adapted to the problem that you're working, that's what it should be. And there's the, there's the, the temptation of thinking that this transfer is, is somehow magic, that it, if you have your tracks that are large and coarse and you have your hexagons that are fine-grained and small, that when you're doing this transfer, you're somehow magically creating more granular information about population, for example, population intensity. And particularly in this algorithm, where you only have, you know, this is, there's no magic here. This is, once you look into the technology, there's no magic, right? You, you only have, at the very best, you only have the information you start with. And at worse and more often, what you have is the information you start with distorted by the boundaries of the target that you want to work with. So you really have to keep that in mind that if you see any pattern that you didn't know before, in this case, you really have to think twice about that's an actual pattern or if something's gone wrong or not gone wrong, but it is a distortion because all we're doing here is distorted, distorting the original data. The counts, the population counts were, were truthful at the track level, right? They weren't at the, at the hexagon. So we're distorting in some ways. But it's a it's a use it's a distortion, but it's a useful distortion because it allows you to then run the model you want. So you know, ideally, you would have the counts at the hexagon, but we don't live in that world. We live in a world where you have your hexagons or you have your counts at census tracts. And now this is not always the case. However, and, and I will say, not always the case with more sophisticated methods because you are bringing more more intelligence to the table when you do things like the symmetric mapping. When you're crossing these with land uses, you are put, you are embedding in your transfer some information and some intelligence about where the data that you have aggregated at polygons in the source geography might be distributed within. It's all based on assumptions. I mean, ultimately, you never know it. If you knew, you wouldn't be doing this. But it is bringing more information about the spatial distribution of this data. So the output that you you get, it's still a distortion, but it's a much more educated distortion if you want to think of it that way. Okay. All right. So, any questions? This is everything I, I wanted to talk about for map matching the first half of of spatial feature engineering. Are there any any questions or or comments or anything to make me shout out for a couple of minutes? Okay. Did you say something about the um, importance of selecting the right population to use in the mapping? Um, because you know, obviously. Depending on what you have data you're trying to transfer over, you need to have a, a population to represent that data, right? So if you had a data set about, um, I don't know, like, like, uh, like, number of people who work in a building, um, for example, or the, 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 the average of time spent in a building, like, or whatever, and you want to transfer that, then you probably don't want to use the census population, right? Because it's about where people are working. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that this is, um, Stuart uh, is asking whether I could say something about choosing the right source population to make this this transfer and he's given the example if you're if you want to get building estimates for for daytime you might not want to use census because that's where people work and so i mean absolutely the maybe i should have stressed when i said this is not magic i really meant it so all the problems you have with using the source geography still applies it's just that you still have a few more problems but then on the other side the good news is you can actually do your model, right? You can run your model. And the choice is you either run your model without any intelligence or with distorted intelligence. So, but absolutely, all the problems that you would have by using your source destination anyway, don't go away. It, they just get compounded with a few more problems on transferring them. So all the, and I think, but it, it's a really pertinent point because again, because of this perception that spatial interpolating is, is some sort of magic. That, that will give you what you want, even you, you really are deep in your heart, you know it doesn't exist, what you want, right? It's, so it's, you, you should really just resist that temptation because it's, it's just that uh, it's a temptation. <laughs>
but yeah, absolutely very good point. Yeah. I think of it as like hallucinating additional information. And sometimes that's useful because it gives you more resolution, but it is also after all a hallucination to some extent. Yeah. And so yeah, yeah. So you always have to what I what I try to tell my students when I teach these things is you always have to put yourself in the feet of the model that you're running. What is the model aware of? It's the same as when we're talking about space. You may think, well, of course, there's a housing model. It, it's got to know that this house is here and that is partly expensive because it's in the city center, not in the middle of nowhere. But then, you, you know, the model is a crude representation. So if there's nothing very explicit in the model that says that that house is there, the model is not going to know it. And it'll be stuffed in a, in a linear regression. It'll be stuffed on the residuals. So with transfer of information is exactly the same. Always think this thing that looks really cool, did it exist on the source? Because if it didn't exist, this should be a really big red flag going up. The only caveat to that, I, I would say, is when you do more sophisticated cases of asymmetric mapping, you are bringing more information. So it's not that it's no longer the case that all the information you have is the original population data set. Because you are combining that with everything you know about where that population is distributed. You know that that you know coarse measure of population for a polygon, you know, you know what that polygon looks like, and you know where that polygon lives, so to speak. So you can say more about it, which is to say you can make more educated guesses in transferring it. But that's only because, again, there's no magic here. The, that's only because you are you do have more information that comes from, say, land use or additional features that you use for the transfer. So I can always think, could this pattern come because I'm adding contextual information to this population estimate? And if that's the case, then that that is part of, that is part of the magic that you get with these methods. But if it doesn't sound sensible, it probably is something else. And you should really think twice about why you're you're getting that. Cool. Anything else? All right. So then uh, on to yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So. I think it really depends in, well, it depends on what you mean by distortion, I suppose, right? Um, you could, I don't have a full answer for these much more than, it depends on what you mean by distortion. In the, it depends on, and it also depends on what acceptable means for you. So the question was, how do you measure the distortion is acceptable or not. And of course, the economist in me says, it depends what you mean by this person, it depends or distortion, it depends what you mean by uh, acceptable. Um, but it is true because the whole point of this, and it's, it's useful to think about it in this term is, you're doing all of these because you don't have the variable you want at the geography that you want. If you did, you wouldn't be doing these. And really to know how distorted your estimates are, you really should know how they are distributed in the in the target geography. So it's it's a bit of a catch twenty two that how you truly measure it. So in the asymmetric mapping, you can and in any other cases, this is ultimately a bit of a prediction con context. So if you if you frame it from that point of view, you can deploy most of the machinery that machine learning has for assessing how good any prediction is, whether it's, it's spatial or, or, or is the behavior of someone on a website. Um, but again, you have to think about how you embed the measure of what you, because distortion can be many things. So you, you need to think of how you embed the notion that you like or that you care about distortion in your metric and then try to embed it into that framework. Um, and I think the other point is in, in many cases, you, you probably will never know for certain because ultimately to know it for certain, you will have to know the, the true underlying distribution and, 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 the, and if you knew it, you wouldn't be doing this. Now, you can do different things. You can, you can set up experiments. You can, if it's a prediction, you can set up 
a cross validation setup. If you have, you know, if you're creating a larger data set, you can set up a almost like a controlled experiment where you have the underlying geography. So if you had for certain geographies only, you had individual population counts, say like people or households geolocated, you could try to aggregate that to the the source geography to the target and then compare that to the true re-aggregation. Um, but of course, if you had that for everyone, you wouldn't be doing this. So it, it, it's a bit of a tricky one. Um, sort of the only thing that I can say is a one, one rule fits all for everything is you should definitely do a qualitative assessment of the output. And if something looks too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. And if it, if it looks roughly on what you would expect, because ultimately you're not creating new information here, right? You have to remember that the, um, the overall pattern should be similar, even though the scale changes. So everything Pedro said about things changing as across scales would apply. So you <laughs> I feel like I, I'm doing a really poor job at answering, but maybe that in itself is an answer for the question. Simulation based approaches, like you know, if you're exposed the relationship between the variables you're using to the transfer simulation synthetic data, aggregated to both magnets, and then do your asymmetric mapping comparison, so like what the underlying. Yeah, so so Stuart yeah. is saying you can do. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, Stuart is saying one one way could be with simulation based approaches. If you know the sort of the generating process that your variable follows, you generate it, you aggregate it at the source. You make the transfer and then also re-aggregate at the target and make the comparison. That's true. But then you also wonder, well, if you really had that magic box that generates the data, why would you be doing all of this anyways in the first place? But but it is true that sometimes we do have that that engine and it is useful and is not exactly what we what we need. So it's I think a lot of this is about trying to get at the, you know, you're never going to see the whole elephant, but you can see there are ways to see the legs, there are ways to see the tail, there are ways to see the trunk in, in focused ways. So if all of it kind of looks like an elephant, maybe it is an elephant that you've done a decent job, right? So it's, but it, I think it's always a world of second best because if you had the first best, you wouldn't be doing this. It's sort of the short, hopefully that answers the question, Eric. Yeah, that was good, thanks. Excellent, any more? Questions or comments? So then we move on to the second half of the of the chapter and the, the second big family of feature spatial feature engineering techniques, which is what in the in the book we tentatively called math synthesis. And this is a bit more of a was more of art, or at least I haven't seen it in other cases. And it's not necessarily the best way of describing, but I think it was a good way to put it in contrast to map matching. Because the idea, if you remember map matching is about matching different maps. So in different ways, whether you have a map of points and a map of polygons and transferring the information from the points to the polygons to points to points, et cetera. The point of map matching is always combining data sources using space as the ultimate linkage key, geography as the ultimate linkage key. The point of map synthesis, however, is not about connecting data sets, it's about making more of each of one of, of each of one data set, right? Each of your data sets. And it's about exploiting or generating, and this is in, in many ways, is a lot more aligned with the traditional feature engineering from other fields in a purely spatial context, right? So if you remember in, at the very beginning, I said feature engineering is something that a lot of um, um, a lot of machine learning does with sound data, because what you have is the sound snippet, or with text data, because what you have is the text uh, corpuses. And you can't fit just a bunch of a bunch of words to a regression model to a random forest. You need to decode the information in that into a way or recast it into a way that effectively looks like a matrix. So a lot of feature engineering for text, for example, is counting words, count, uh, measuring the length of sentences, measuring the length of paragraphs. There's a, a whole lot of you know word frequency, etc. And ultimately, it's just creating columns where you have a value for every observation. And because once you have that, then you can plug it into a, a, a model of your interest. The idea of map synthesis is, is actually a lot more aligned with that notion in the spatial context. What we're doing is 
in so many words, we're trying to summarize space, we're trying to summarize geography, we're trying to summarize the spatial configuration of our observations, of our data points into summary descriptives, into metrics that tell us something about that pattern in effectively one number. Because if we do that, it'll be imperfect, but if we do that, we can then plug it as an additional metric or an additional feature for our models. And it might say something useful to either understand or predict the phenomenon that we're trying to understand, yeah, or that we're trying to model. So map synthesis, I'm gonna to go to the table of contents again. Uh, there's many techniques, the spatial analysis literature has many ways of, of, of looking at it and we really only scratch the surface of what, what's possible. And, and we do this because just like in the traditional, in the non-spatial feature engineering, a lot of this boils down to, to what the books call domain expertise, which is to say uh, creativity. This is when, where science stops and art begins. It's about thinking of creative ways of describing or summarizing characteristics of the data in basically in quantitative ways, in, in metrics that you can summarize in, into a number. So hopefully what this section of the chapter does is spark your creative juices to think, make help you think in, along these ways for the problems that you have and for ways of, of summarizing, capturing the, the aspects of, that you're interested in or that you think are relevant for your, for your model. So in the chapter, we have three examples and you have them here. One is counting neighbors. The other one is uh, getting distance buffers and the other one is ring buffers. Um, and then we have one with actual clustering. The first three are sort of the same thing with slightly different twists. And they have a lot to do with the spatial weights matrices that Pedro was talking about. And in fact, they are ways of operationalizing spatial weights matrices into a modeling context or their one way of, of doing it. What it's really about is, think of how Pedro talked about spatial weights matrices. They are a way of abstracting at least one as aspect of geography in your data set. In this case is topology or the spatial configuration, who is next to who and who is far from who. And in some cases, how, how next to someone you are or how far away you are. There's different ways of, of um, capturing and explaining this, but ultimately it's all about this, is who are your neighbors and who are not. Of course, the devil's in the details of what you mean by neighbor, but that gives you a, a very rich gamut of options to, to come up with different specifications. So you can use that notion to augment your, or to synthesize the, this pattern of topology, this topological pattern or this pattern of the spatial configuration. And in some cases, all you really want to know is where you fit into the, the broader topology. So for example, the, the first one, counting neighbors, is really about, in our case, for, for Airbnbs, remember the Airbnb data set, you might hypothesize that if you're an Airbnb surrounded by a lot of other Airbnbs, if the spatial competition literature in economics and industrial organization has any resemblance with reality, you might think that there's more spatial competition that if you're very expensive, you know, someone will go for the next one, for the one next door, because it offers almost everything that is around it, but, but at a cheaper price. Now, of course, you could then also bring in, you know, take off your industrial organization hat and bring on your geographer's one and your spatial heterogeneity one and say, if you're here with a million other people, maybe there's a reason why a million other people want to be there, right? So, but in either case, the point that you are where a million other people are probably says something about your location and about the kind of observation that you are. And again, in the original non-spatial model, the model wouldn't know it because all it, the model all the model would see is just a bunch of rows. It doesn't know how the first row relates to the second and to the last. It just says, in fact, that's the whole point. You know, the IID is identically and independently distributed. Right, So a lot of what we're doing here is trying to teach the model a little bit, not, not you know, very, very crudely, but a little bit how the different observations, the different rows in the table relate to each other, or at least 
the, the part of that relationship that we think is relevant. So the simplest possible one is counting neighbors. Um, there's a big catch with counting neighbors is that you have to define what is a neighbor and, and that may or may not be easy or may or may not be straightforward. In some problems it's very straightforward and others it's a bit trickier and, and it's a much more of an arbitrary uh, boundary that you have to you have to draw. Another one that uh, urban economies love is this idea of rings and buffers. That's how space is organized in their minds in most cases. And for a good reason, in, in many problems, it, it, does, it, does, uh, it does work as a good proxy. But the idea is that you would count neighbors, immediate neighbors, and then you would draw a bigger buffer and you would subtract those neighbors. So you would almost draw this donut buffer of observations that are within 500 and 750 meters and count how many. And in some problems, there's a really good reason why you would want to do that because immediately it might not be a good thing to be too close, but if you're close but not too close, that might be good. Um, Luke, Luke Hansen has a paper, he always cites as the example of, of the access to parks. In some cities or in, in some contexts, being too close to the park may not be great because uh, at night, uh, the lights might go off and it might attract more crime, et cetera. But during the day is a pretty great thing to be close to the park, right? So you still wanna have access, but you might not be, be like right next to it. So in that case, things like uh, counting um, building rings might be, might be useful. And then the last one, which is the one I'm going to, to use for the example here is, um, and I'm gonna let, this one while I talk is this idea of whoops using clustering as in spatial clustering as a as a way of feature engineering. So the idea here is taking a bit taking one step further this notion of uh, counting neighbors or abstracting it one step further and saying rather than looking at how many neighbors are within 500 meters, I'm gonna first detach from all of these, run a clustering algorithm, a spatial clustering algorithm on my data set and determine hotspots or clusters or, or concentrations of uh, points and not in, a, in an ad hoc way, but I'm gonna use a, an, a statistical technique that will determine whether something is a cluster or not. And then I'm gonna use cluster membership. So whether you're part of a cluster or not, or whether you're part of one particular cluster or another one as a, as a feature for my model. And in this case, it would be as a simple dummy variable that you can stick on your regression or your model. And it would be saying, is the Airbnb part of a cluster or not? So in the uh, book, we use as an example, the HDB scan algorithm, which is stands for hierarchical DB scan or hierarchical density base spatial clustering applications with noise. DBSCAN, if, you, if you're familiar with the literature, you, you would have heard, but if you aren't, is a staple of uh, unsupervised learning. It's an algorithm that came from the you know, data mining world. I think it's a 96 paper. It basically it is a way, is a deterministic way, non-statistical. Non it doesn't have an, an, a probabilistic um, underpinning, but it's a pretty handy way of identifying pockets of high density in a in a point data set. And when I say point data set, I really mean a cloud data set, right? Because points may, may have two locations, like some wise, or may have 20. In, in fact, the, the ultimate irony I find of DBSCAN is that it's called spatial, but it was originally designed not for spatial application necessarily. The idea of using with space is you, you just take latitude and longitude or X and Y coordinates as your features and then run the, the algorithm. Uh, one of the great things of DBSCAN is that it's a pretty simple algorithm, so it's intuitive. One of the not so great is that it is a pretty simple algorithm, so it requires two parameters that you have to pick out of thin air, unless you have a really good reason for values. And in most cases, you, you don't, I guess, because if you did, you probably wouldn't be doing this. So HDBSCAN partially solves this by reducing the, the number of uh, ad hoc so choices from two to one. So it's a 50% reduction is great. You don't have to be as, as ad hoc uh, and you only have to say how big a group of observations needs to be 
for it to be considered a, a cluster. So what is the minimum size for, for a cluster? Uh, the other one in the traditional one is the radius. So how far out you go from any, any point to, to look for neighbors. And that's what uh, the HCV scanning makes endogenous. So I'm not going to say much more. Uh, you should check it out. DB scan is, is pretty widely used and in many cases is, is very useful. So what we're doing here is we're going to run HDB scan on, uh, on our set of Airbnb properties. And what we're, the rationale for that is saying, well, I'm, we're going to try to see if there are parts of San Diego that are hotspots for Airbnb. There are pockets where there's a high density of Airbnb. Of course, the high density of points is, is a tricky thing conceptually for points, right? For, for, po for polygons, it's a pretty straightforward thing. You just calculate how many there are per polygon, divide by the area, pick the highest number or, or the, about the threshold. The tricky thing with points is that you don't have a container to get the area for, for the density. So that's what the, where DBSCAN comes in handy. It effectively runs a window across every point um, and gives you a... a it's a, it's a window of densities that it calculates. So extra points for the algorithm. I won't get into much more detail. So how do we do these? Uh, HDB scan doesn't work with geometries because what I was saying is not, it's despite the S is actually not a spatial algorithm or necessarily a spatial. So what it just takes is a, is a matrix of features, a table where every row is an observation and every column is a, is a feature. In our case, we have two features, X and Y coordinates. So we need to convert the geometry column that contains the point into two columns, one for the X, one for the Y. And that's actually pretty, it used to be a bit of a pain, but it's, it's pretty straightforward now. We just can call the geometry attribute here. And then inside the geometry, we can call the, uh, the X and the Y attributes. And that will give us a, a column of, and actually an, an array, if that means anything to you. And we bind those two, we glue them together into a, a NumPy. We, stack them as columns and we call that coordinates. Coordinates is this matrix of um, as many rows as Airbnb locations and two columns, one for X, one for Y. That's all we need. Well, we actually need one more thing, which is the number of observations that we want. And here it's a bit of a pick out of thin air, but we think, well, maybe 25 is good enough. So for the illustration is definitely good enough. So we follow the standard scikit learn um, pattern, which if you've used once, you, you know how to use for absolutely everything. You first define the algorithm, in this case, HTB scan. You pass the hyperparameters, so all the parameters that, you, that the algorithm needs to run. And that's what we're doing in the highlighted section. And then once you have that defined, you fit it to the data. And in this case, we fit it to the coordinates. And just because we're that cool, all in one line, we define the algorithm, we fit it. And then on the fly, we pull out the set of labels. So the set of labels is going to give you for every Airbnb, whether it's part of a, well, the unique ID of the cluster that it is part of, that the observation is part of. And yeah, the, one of the cool things of DBSCAN and HDBSCAN by extension is you don't have to be part of a cluster if you're not part of a cluster. So if you're an outlier, that's the, uh, the noise part of the, of the N in DBSCAN. If you're not part of a cluster in cycle, then you get a minus one. So everything that gets a minus one is not in a cluster. So we run this, we get a bunch of warnings, but warnings are okay. And then what we're doing in the, in the book also is, uh, and I'll skip the code, but it's creating polygons. So the idea of a cluster, the idea of a, of a hotspot over space, at least for me, intuitively, it's an area. Right, And the way we define areas in GIS is through polygons, not through collections of points. So DBSCAN gives you the, it's like a zip code geography. It gives you a bunch of points that are part of, that make up that zip code. What we're doing here is creating the polygon out of it. It's of course imperfect, but it's, it's a good, approximate, good enough approximation that's, that I think is worth incurring for, for this example. So what we, what we have here is a map of San Diego. Every dot is uh, an Airbnb property in our data set. And then what we're getting here is the clusters of, of, um, of density um, that DBS can identifies. So in blue, we get the noise, the properties that are not part of a cluster. And then uh, within the polygons, we get the 
the clusters. So the idea, so this, so far this is entirely an application HDB scan. The feature engineering here comes from now that we have these, now that we know this aspect of the spatial configuration of data in our data set, we can distill it into basically a set of metrics. Remember, that's what, what I said it is. In this case, it's just a set of binary variables that say, are you part of, well, you can do it in two, two, two flavors. One is, are you part of a cluster or not? So a zero one, or are you part of cluster A? Are you part of cluster B? Are you part of cluster Z? And that would give you much more uh, granularity at the cost of increasing the number of, of columns, okay? So it's 424. I had an example here that is not part of the, of the book. I'm going to leave it for a, a homework for everyone who is excited enough to try it out at home. And if you uh, want to send it back to me by email, I will uh, be very happy. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy also to answer them. I had an example of additional code of running the baseline model that Pedro started with, the non-spatial one, the one that doesn't know anything about space, and then sticking an extra variable later for whether the, the property is part of a cluster or not. So it's a very, very simple way of embedding space. And what I, I had there is you, if you look at the R square or if you look at the MSE based on as, as a prediction measure, there's no cross validation here, but you could do it and, and the result will be the same. You do get an improvement. It's not a massive one, but you also have to think again, there's no magic here. You're not creating any, any magic here. We're just saying, are you part of a cluster or are you not? And that cluster, remember that it's somewhat, in our case, we picked 25, so you might want to optimize that a little bit more. But the idea being that still even that simple um, inclusion of a bit of spatial intelligence in your model does increase the prediction power of your model. And it does, and it also turns out to be significant. Because again, I think in this case, the geographer, um, the geographer interpretation, the idea that if if there's a million houses there. Maybe there is something that that my that is a value. I, I, it probably um, prevails, but I, I won't show it. Leave it as a, a homework, and um, if you have any issues, contact me, and I'll be happy. And then before we, uh, I I leave you and I open for questions and comments. I want to say two more things. One, remind you that the book you. You can buy it yet, but when you can, if you want to buy it, uh, we will not say no. Um, and But if you just want to use it, the website is geographicdata.science forward, uh, forward slash book. And also the other thing I wanted to bring to your attention, we have a we have a blog on the book at geographicdata.science. And a couple of weeks ago, we put out a community call. So we're actually very, very close to be done with the book. We are just putting the last, the final touches. We're writing the epilogue and we're just having a final um, pass. And there's so many, th there's only so much that three, the three of us, Levi Search and I can do in terms of catching bugs, in terms of rereading. There's only so many times I can reread something without assuming it's just fine and, and wanting to skip. And I'm very, very close to that <laughs> number of reads. So we could really use with, uh, with more eyeballs. So if you wanna check out the book online, it's all online. The community call is there. And what we're basically saying is if you run into any typo or any comment of something that doesn't look uh, right, please fire up uh, fire an issue on GitHub. Or if you're not into the, if you're not very familiar with the GitHub um, workflow, just send us an email and we'll add it for you on, on GitHub. But it would be really, really useful if you catch anything. Sometimes I think sometimes people, I, I find that sometimes people, are a bit afraid because it's like you're bringing up your book is wrong and i actually love it when you tell me that it's wrong because we can fix it so at least now when it once it's, it's printed maybe i'll i'll shut down <laughs> my email for a few months uh because there won't be much i can do but until then any issue if you come across uh do report it and we'll be super happy and with that uh i'm just gonna wrap up and if there's any questions and just from pedro and me thank you very much um, to everyone in the room and for the online audience as well. It's been really great to know that there's a lot of people in the interwebs sort of tuning into for the for the session. So thanks very much. And any questions or comments about these or about anything else, uh, it'll be, I'll, we'll be happy to take them. Yeah, Victor's asking whether the, the session will be
post it afterwards. So it is being recorded and Julia said that it'll be posted on, on the Center for Spatial Data Science website at the at U Chicago. It'll be announced when it's when it's out. So yes, it will be available. Cool. So this is uh, the highly unusual case where I am one minute ahead of schedule. Let's just uh, make it a brilliant day and 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 for once uh, stop in time. Thank you very much, everyone, again, and, and thanks to the um, online audience.